listen to the vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I'm very privileged to have Mr. Steve Horowitz here with me. He is a musician, and uh, you have a remaster of some of your earlier work coming out in September, correct? That is correct. I'm a composer and a bass player, and uh, the album that's coming out in September is a remastered version of my first two string quartets. I want to talk about bass players while while I got you on here too, because uh, that's good. I like to talk about it. bass players. See see what's behind me. That's my bass. That's my that's my new baby. Five wow. string. Man, I've got a squire, and uh, I don't I don't know how to play very well, but I try. <laughs> but um tell us a little bit about yourself oh what do you want to know man Just your run-of-the-mill composer running around making music <laughs> <laughs> pretty much it so where, where'd you grow up um let's see i was born in brooklyn okay lived there tough and strong till i was five <laughs> and then my family actually moved to miami so i, I went to uh Upwards, uh, uh, just until high school, I lived in uh, in Miami, Florida. Grew up there, and uh, and right after, um, just before high school, my my family moved out to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. So I went to high school at Berkeley, Berkeley High School, and uh, consider the Bay Area to kind of be my home. Wow, you spent some, you... I spent some years living in uh, in the Netherlands. Oh, cool! Four years in, in Amsterdam and and uh, Utrecht, and then four years in uh, no, ten years, over ten years in Manhattan. And then moved back to uh, the Bay Area in 2010 and been Man. living here back ever since. So east, west, east, west, east, west. All over the place, <laughs> man. Yeah. So when, when did you pick up the bass? Oh, man, that's, a, that's a, yeah, it's a good question. So I started out when I was living in Florida. I started out playing guitar when I was six years old. My sister had guitar lessons at the local music house, the House of Music. Actually, the family that owned the House of Music lived next to next door to us uh, in Miami, oh. the Bards, not making that up. That was that was really their name. They ran the local music shop. And I took guitar lessons there with this, this I still remember this man, this, this guy, Felix Valadespino was my first guitar player. And he told me about his band, Agape. And I had no idea what agape meant for many, many years because I was like six, seven years old. I was just like, that sounds cool. And he just, you know, I used to bring in popular songs of the day. I'd be like, I want to learn how to play Beatles songs or I want to learn how to play, you know, uh, Cold as Ice, whatever it was, you know, All Right Now by Free. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I started out on guitar and I was, I was okay. I wasn't a great guitar player. Um, it wasn't until we moved to Berkeley and um, I started at Berkeley High School and I found out that they needed a bass player for the jazz band. Oh. And the way they did it in Berkeley, they had a really award-winning, wonderful, amazing jazz program. They still do in Berkeley. And the way it worked is you'd start in the lab band. You have to audition. And mm -hmm. so I went down. It was Phil Hardiman, who was the teacher at the time. He was quite a, quite a well-known and wonderful educator um passed away many years ago but he was a great mentor to me and he gave me my first bass showed me how to do some walking bass lines and i had just been totally a rocker up to then and i was like i found my instrument I, I i knew i was a bass player at that point so i auditioned for the lab band and i got in and then i auditioned for the big band and got into the the berkeley high school big band as well so kind of went from rock to jazz and then started listening to we were just talking about frank zappa oh yeah through listening to Zappa, you know, he would talk about Varez, Edgar Varez and other contemporary composers. So I started listening to that. And then that's how I kind of started my path into contemporary classical music. So, yeah. And playing jazz, you have to be a pretty good musician. Yeah, I faked it pretty well for a while and then I got OK. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I, you know, it, it, it's funny. It's like, you know, in terms of playing rock, you learn a lot of stuff and you know, I would say, you know, I played, a, I've played a lot of jazz and I still do play jazz. Um, but I don't, I don't consider myself like, you know, a hardcore jazz musician, you know, it's like, I, for years I was, you know, after post high school, you know, and during high school, you know, uh, towards my senior year and, and coming out, I would, I would do gigs and, 
played upright bass and but man it's you know you know i wasn't one of those guys who like you know didn't need the fake book you know i had to take the real book with me to play the tunes i didn't know it all back and forward and <laughs> yeah so so who is your favorite bass player mm, such an unfair question i mean i have to start <laughs> I, with, I have to start with with jocko okay. so jocko pastorius um huge influence on me and on my playing fantastic player um let's see who else comes to mind um let's see on on yeah stanley clark those were oh, early amazing. influences you know mm -hmm. um bootsy collins oh yeah boots is great you know and uh you know ray brown for upright bass okay you know um who played with oscar peterson um man so many bass players unfair unfair question man um no it's a good it's a it's a great question eddie gomez i love eddie gomez is playing man um yeah my all-time favorite is john entwistle i just think that's that, awesome that guy was doing stuff back in the 60s that nobody was doing yeah it was incredible yeah. Agreed. No, and Whistle's amazing too. I mean, yeah, if you're getting, and then you got to talk about Chris Squire, mm -hmm. a huge influence, you know, with the S. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, one of my favorite bass players. You know, there, you've got so many different genres, and you, there's the uh, the split offs because you know you got rock and you got hard rock, and then you get into like metal, and you have death metal, speed metal, and all that. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different you know uh cliff burton from metallica i mean yeah he was i thought he was the best in that genre uh paul mccartney paul mccartney's <laughs> you know horse uh, yeah best in pop uh, oh my gosh uh, you remember mr big yeah, of course. I cannot. What was think that? Billy that Sheehan. Guy. Billy Sheehan. Yeah, that's Billy right. Sheehan. Yeah, that awesome. guy is freaking awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh gosh, I mean, that you could sit here and name a, a a bunch of them that are that are great. I just thought Entwistle kind of stood out for me. Well, Entwistle was, I mean, when it, like when I was playing guitar and in my, you know, starting out. I mean, the Who were I love the Who, man. Mm -hmm. Entwistle okay. was great because he could play so you know he had the super fast double finger thing going on and then he, was, he got the other fingers into it too it's like what's happening you know when he did his solo part in in my generation yep the, i'm like yeah it blows the mind yeah uh i i i've seen billy sheehan live and I didn't realize how good that guy really was. So I saw him up and he played with Steve Vai. Yeah. He's fant He's fantastic. I mean, that's the thing is like, for me, the core is really, you know, Jocko, Stanley Clark, and, you know, some of the older school upright bass players, you know, from Ray Brown to Niels Henning, Austin Pedersen. And, and those guys are the ones that really kind of, but then you start talking about it and there's so just, just so many, so many great bass, but flea. Flea's a great bass Flea's player. great, yeah. That dude's I, awesome. I saw them, but I also saw Primus, and I thought Les Claypool yeah. blew Les them Claypool, all away. Local boy? Oh, man, that guy. <laughs> he does stuff that I've never heard before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, there's such an array of, of great musicians out there, and, and I, I think they're still holding on because there's still guys like us that love that kind of music, but everything's turning electronic and yeah. doesn't have the same soul to it that those guys did. And especially like you, you, we talked about the Beatles earlier, mm -hmm. they, they did all their stuff live in the, uh, in the studio. It wasn't, you know, I do my part and then you come in and do your part. They did it all together. Yeah especially early on. I mean, later they did a bunch of, you know, overdubbing and right, right. multi-tracking, but, but yeah, absolutely. You, you know, it kind of, this period of time in some ways kind of reminds me of, uh, of the eighties again, mm -hmm. you know, it's sort of like, remember 
remember when David Byrne, I, I don't know whether it was the eighties or the nineties, but David Byrne was talking about how great the seventies sounded, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and then we were all thinking, but disco and disco songs, you know, but then you go back <laughs> and you listen to the seventies compared to the eighties. It was all drum machines in the eighties. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and, but you listen to the seventies and you start to listen to the, especially R and B. And it's just like, this sounds fantastic. Right. Cause it's live musicians, live humans playing freaking great grooves. Right. Um, Kind of reminds me of that a little bit, you know, with a lot of the electronica that's coming in these days, you know. Yeah, yeah I mean, there, there's still great bands that are out there that are actually playing their own instruments, but mm -hmm. um, they, they, they're almost underground in a way. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird because I I'll I'll uh, be like on LinkedIn and I'm following a musician that I love mm -hmm. on there, and then find out that they've had some new music out never even knew it came out right and then go back and watch their youtube videos and i'm like why is it this on the radio you know <laughs> well because i mean what is radio these days anyway right yeah, i mean it's, it's, it's like everything streaming. splintered apart into a million pieces i mean you know mm -hmm. um you know, if we, we just start talking, it will sound like dinosaurs, you know, back in the day, you know, radio. <laughs> but you know, what's interesting, though, is like, you know, I have a son, you know, he's 20, he just turned 21. Oh, you know, yeah. you know, they still, you know, they're still marketing to different demographics, you know. And I think actually, there's more marketing than ever before in music to to different demographics. And, you know, he seems to find all the all the new you know, hip hop, R&B, electronica acts, and he knows all about them, you know, right. from stuff that's, you know, being, you know, and, and it's not even radio. He doesn't listen to the radio, right? Yeah. It's all through streaming services, you know, Instagram, you know, whatever social media he's on. So I think it's more than ever, we, we get narrow casted, right? Because they just look age wise, you know, and it's like, all right, you're going to want to listen to, you know, classic rock and you know, you need to buy Viagra or something like that. You know, it's like, it's like, that's all the ads are all like, do you need a prosthetic leg? Do you have erectile dysfunction? And would you like to listen to the hoop? Right. So reverse, it mortgage. Goes, <laughs> you need reverse mortgage. It all goes together. Right. You know? Yeah. You know, so, so it's, you know, what I've been finding about, out about some new music and, and, and bands, but it mostly comes from my students these days. You know, they'll say, have you heard, or have you heard this or that? And then I go listen and, some of them are pretty good. You know, one of them that comes up recently that I that I found out about is so you know that film that came out, uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. I've I've heard of it, but I have not seen it. Yeah, it's a it's a trippy film. You just check it out; it's a good film. But the um the soundtrack was done by you know what, they call themselves an experimental pop band called Sun Lux, S O N L U X. Mm. Hmm. so you know it's like from that soundtrack which i thought was actually really wonderful for the awesome for the film um i started listening to some of their other stuff too they're pretty good you know it's like so that's how i'm finding out about stuff is through my students or through some things it, it, it comes you got to kind of break out of the you got to break out of your uh your patterns yeah when i lived back in houston i used to listen to a college radio station and, and they played stuff that was more b-sides and totally just, you know uh, i guess you consider underground and there was a band out of miami they're called elastic bond now they're oh. they've got uh, more latin sound to them but they yeah. they do music that sounds like it came from the 70s they they'll they'll kind of mix a little bit of hip-hop in with it and I, you know i'm not a big fan of hip-hop but the way they did it sounded really cool mm -hmm. and that it's it's uh such a mix it's almost i, I don't want to say zappa-esque but almost you know yeah it's, they take all these different genres mix them up and they've got a great groovy sound the the lady that sings for them is, her voice is phenomenal uh, the musicians are incredible and, and, and so we got in to listen to them. Not I listened to it on Spotify. Uh, we we still like to listen to Houston radio sometimes, even though I don't like mm. living there. I like the music. <laughs> yep. And, and uh, so we got iHeartRadio, and we'll play the, them in the morning while we're getting ready for our day. And, and um, 
it's it, radio is just playing stuff that's been out for a while it seems i don't hear a whole lot of new stuff on there but it's a classic yeah. rock station so yeah no it doesn't seem to be the function of radio that much anymore to to, to do that um you know I, i'm i you know i'm i'm guilty i'm not a huge fan of the you know the streaming services in terms of the way that you know royalties and money and musicians and all of that stuff but at the same time you know I use my son's Spotify account. Spotify, if you're listening, I'm sorry, I'm sharing his account. <laughs> but um, I have to say, I, you know, I felt, you know, it, it's so, it reminded me of like, remember when you first, when YouTube kind of hit, mm -hmm. and you like, you fell into that YouTube hole, and you're like talking to your friends, and you're like, I, I can't believe I'm seeing this footage of you know, X Ben, whether it's whether it's Monk or Zappa or whoever it is, you know, I can't believe I'm seeing this stuff or hearing this stuff that you know, for years was not available. Right. And I feel the same way with Spotify. I, I fall into Spotify and I'm, I'm hearing stuff that I've never heard before. Oh gosh. And by the way, I should say, I actually forgot to tell you about my all-time favorite bass player ever, probably the biggest influence on me, Charlie Hayden. Okay. So Charlie Hayden is hands down, you know, he has fantastic unbelievable bass player but i was thinking about him in relation to like you know i'm going through spotify and i'm hearing stuff you know that i thought i knew and, and albums i've never seen before or heard before so you know yeah. well if there's a band that i've been listening to for years and i'll turn on spotify all of a sudden pop up new music from so-and-so mm -hmm. Wow, why didn't I hear about this sooner? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? exactly. I, I mean, I, I'm not gonna lie. I, I use Spotify all the time. You know, yep. if I'm out in the back barbecuing, friends are over, I'll turn on Spotify. And there's so many albums that I would love to buy, but I haven't had the money to buy it, so I get to listen to it through that. Absolutely. But I'll yeah. I'll I'll say there's kind of a push i guess to bring vinyl back oh yeah uh, and i was so happy walking by one the uh electronic section in walmart i saw there was rolling stones the, the hot rocks album and then there was van halen 1984 and then i looked they've got all the van halen albums in one section and oh dude you know the crazy thing is that you know i was just I was just over at Amoeba Records the other day here, you know, over in Berkeley. And, you know, I looked up on the wall and they're like, they're selling albums that I bought for $3.99 for like $120, you know. It's nuts. And the prices are ridiculous. I know. Right? But um, whenever I first started buying records, my, I think Van Halen and all that, it was like six, seven bucks. Yep. And now they're almost $30. Yeah, it's crazy. People are buying Dark Side of the Moon for 50 bucks, you know? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. You know, but that's the dream. That's always was, you know, once you hit the 80s, that was, you know, once the format started changing so rapidly, that was the dream of record executives. That's the dream of, you know, you can just put stuff out that's already been out in another format and sell it to people again. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to invest in an artist. You don't have to invest in new music. You just put out the same shit that you put out before <laughs> on a different format and make more money from it. I mean, I had the Leonard Skinner eight track and I bought the record and I bought the cassette and then yep. ended up buying the CD. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not going back. I'm not buying LPs again. I mean, I sold all my albums, you know, before I moved to the, before I moved to Holland, I went up and sold everything and took CDs with me. I'll, I'm going to be buried with my compact disc. I mean, hopefully there'll be a compact disc, uh, you know, resurgence, but I, I, I don't know. I don't see that coming. <laughs> yeah. It, it's crazy when you go to the store and you see all these new albums and I'm like, well, why do we even bother to buy them anymore? Because you can yeah. just get a streaming service, what, 10 yeah. bucks a month and you can listen to endless amounts of music. I know people but, do like, you know, they are buying them though. It's like, you know, my thing is, is there's always been something special about picking up a record. Yep. And looking at the album cover, especially when you could unfold them and open up the inside, and totally. some of them had the the music, the the music sheets or the lyric sheets. Some of them yep. had posters in them. Yep. And, I mean, I, I went. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I missed that too. The size of the artwork is, you know, uh, 
I, I definitely miss that. Um, I was just going to tell you, I saw an incredible, um, this was several years ago when LPs were starting to pick up again and, you know, uh, mastering factories were coming back in and, and, and doing pressings again. And, and I saw this interview with like a 20 year old kid and he was so amazed. He's like, he's like, just what you're talking about. He's like, it's like, I'm holding music in my hand. It's like, it's been chiseled into the, and he was like, fascinated you know by i'm like yeah that's a that's an lp <laughs> that's how it used to be not i went out and bought the white album just so i could get the poster out of it again because I, I i used to have it and through the years i lost it yeah <laughs> dark side of the moon just to get the posters out of it oh man those were the days though i, I that was my dream was i was going to grow up and design album covers what happened i got married too soon kids mm. came around and you know you just jump on the first job you can get and try to make ends meet yeah so that's why i encourage anyone out there if you're young why don't you get your life started before you think about getting married <laughs> yeah so i mean i got a daughter that's turning 30 in about a week or so congratulations that, that, that's making me old, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. Do you need um, a reverse mortgage? <laughs> I might. <laughs> Pay, paying for grandkids I know now. <laughs> it could hook you up. It's, it's not Tom Selleck, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be him. It's some guy with a mustache. I don't know. You need a reverse mortgage to get all these grandkids Christmas presents and stuff. <laughs> but... Uh, so you got some music on some some uh, films yourself, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I sort of stumbled into doing, you know, composing for visual media and for scoring um, for film. Um, I had done some indie films and some smaller projects when I was living, you know, in San Francisco in the '90s, and. Um, but mostly when I was here, that's when I started doing music for games, right? Right. Um, I worked for companies like, you know, I, I had a friend of mine who had a company called Neuromantic Productions. And, uh, you know, we did music for, for Sega and Sony and Crystal Dynamics and all, you know, all sorts of games back in the early 90s. That was the Sillywood, right? The merger of Silicon Valley and, and Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But I was always doing, you know, film scores and stuff like that. There was a, there was a place... Uh, um, still here actually called the lab in San Francisco. And they had one of the first sound labs, which, um, you know, they had one of the first pro tool setups, you know, when it was pro deck and pro edit and there was an external box to it. So they, they had that lab and my buddy was working there, um, and running the sound lab. And then he, he got the gig as a roadie with faith no more. Oh, wow. He went, he went <laughs> out on the road with them. And then when the, when Billy, the guitar player quit, he took over so he went out on tour and he became the guitar player in faith no more <laughs> oh, and he was like i'm going out on tour with faith no more do you want to work you know run the sound lab so i started doing that um with uh with digital recording you know back in the day so what makes you uh, decide what sound's going to go with what in the video game i've been curious about that wow wow for games so i mean you know it's a that's a that's a you know it's a big question um games are awesome you know films films are cool mm -hmm. and film has had a long time to sort of codify and figure out what it is when it wants to be when it grows up and it grew up um games are really you know each one is different right as right. you're working on a game it, it's just you know the mechanic is different the animations are different um so you know it's 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 just like anything else with visual media it usually starts by me just you know either playing through it or looking at the game and and hearing music mm -hmm. um and then following that voice that's that's what happened with me with with supersize me right when i when i was in new york i i, I was living in uh, the netherlands and i moved back to new york and i met morgan through my cousin um and uh he actually at that time was working on a television show that he was it was a web show called uh, i bet you will and 
I, we did a bunch of episodes just for the web, and then he sold it to MTV, and we did a bunch of episodes for MTV. Um, and then he got this idea to do Super Size Me, and I remember the spotting session. We just went in, we looked at the film, we were talking about, you know, what kind of music, and I left there with the theme for Super Size Me in my head. Wow. You know, it's like, and I went home and just worked on that. So it's kind of mysterious. You never know. You know, it's always a matter of looking at what's there and seeing what you hear. Mm -hmm. you know and sometimes good things happen you don't even you don't even know it <laughs> it i i love looking at movies that somebody has picked the perfect songs to go with it and especially when it's from you know my my time growing up in the 70s and 80s and uh it's like man that would be such a cool job to be able to decide oh, that, well, that would be good but that's my, it's got to be that's difficult my that's my pet peeve, man. It's like, uh, so music, so it, you know, back in the day, yeah, songs were always actually from the beginning of film, right? Even from the early part of film, even the 20, in, even in the, in the thirties, you know, there was a bifurcation in, in film music where, um, you had underscore, you know, which was composers who were writing original music and you had songs that were in there. Sometimes they were adapted from jazz or adapted from classical, right. you know, but songs would be in there. Um, so that's always that's always been a thing. But what it turned into now is you have, you know, music supervisors, right? Who have a lot of power. That's one of my pet peeves is you turn on television, any show that lots of shows that you could think of or movies that you see, and it's just wall to wall music, right? So if it takes place in the 70s, it's just wall to wall music from all the right. 70s that have been licensed. That's all that's what music supervisors do. All right. You know, they're not they're not composers. They're usually people who love music, they're music aficionados um, who are lawyers. And their gig is to go and find, you know, to know enough about music and, and different genres to license the right songs for the films, right? Right. But I got to tell you, it's like, there's so many times I turn, I, I watch stuff and I'm just like, this is like, it's it's like somebody left the radio on in the background. No, that's true. <laughs> you know? That's and I'm true. Just like, it's like, you know, and also it's like, it's like, bludgeoning sometimes it's like you know somebody's sad and it's like you know there's a song with the word sad in it <laughs> you know yeah. it's like it's like you know somebody's angry and it's like elvis castello i'm not angry you know it's like i'm like just stop this madness this is insane <laughs> well so, I, you know it's I a do... pet peeve of mine because i it's not that i don't like you know songs that are put into films it can be done really effectively but i think it's 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 such an overused trope now that it's 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 kind of brutal oh uh, I, I understand that but I, you know i do appreciate like like john williams and the things that he's done i mean good lord star wars and yep. all that. there's music you hear the theme and you automatically think okay well that's star wars or that's superman or what that's have right. you and, and that's a talent in itself that's rare also in in the film if you think about it it's it's you know you can probably count on one hand you know those moments right composers who have burned themselves into into the modern you know psyche that way you know so if you hear ee, 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 <laughs> right you're just thinking about bernard herman and you're thinking about psycho and if you hear you're just thinking about Ennio Morricone, you know, and the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. right? So you, yeah, same <laughs> with Star Wars. You hear, you know, bah, 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 and you're just like, okay, that's Star Wars. Oh, yeah. Did you know that he, he uh, a lot of that score, you know, the Star Wars um, was actually, I don't want to say lifted, but probably lifted or stolen from, uh, uh, there's a composer named uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold, okay. who was a, uh, he was like, in the 30s right came to hollywood from from you know escaping basically like a lot of the composers did at the time escaping from you know nazi germany and what was going on in europe um and there's this film called king's row go ahead and take a listen to it and you'll be like oh that's where that came from <laughs> that's where star wars came from yeah but sometimes i get on this kick where all i want to watch is old westerns and it's funny you mentioned Clint Eastwood because we were watching uh, uh, a fistful of dollar, dollars and for a few dollars more, and I, oh, and yeah. I, I listened to the to the soundtrack. Those old spaghetti westerns used to come 
come up with? And where did they come up with the idea of these, you know, a bell at this certain time? Oh, and all? that's that's the genius of Morricone, man. I mean, those, especially those three films, right? You know, that that trilogy. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I mean, and Morricone, he 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 is an unbelievable musician, right? He just you know, he won the Academy Award for for the Hateful Eight for the Tarantino film. Right. But he was long, long overdue. I mean, that guy that he 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 is a fantastic musician. He he played with uh, improvised music groups in, in Europe. He's a trumpet player. His father was a trumpet player. Um, you know, I'm not going to remember the name of it now, but I mean, the the ensemble, the group that he played with was like one of the most influential improvised music groups in in uh, in Europe at the time. And um, he's got a, a staggering number of chamber music albums of his concert and classical music that's outside of film and just, yeah, he's deep. What's interesting, you know, if, if you're curious about it, um, so he was a, he also was a pop music producer yeah. for Italian radio. Okay. And, you know, if you go back and listen to some of those, you'll know where the sound of the good, the bad, the ugly come from. Because Sergio Leone, when they got together and they were talking about the music, he referenced some of those Italian pop records, which had, you know, the trumpet thing, which all the Morricone films have on it, right? You know, the like, you know, um, and you hear that sound actually in those pop records. So that was Sergio Leone going like, we should do something like this. And that's superimposed on, you know, on those films. It's, awesome uh, what i like is when you can hear and it's all it is is music but it can make you giggle it's like in uh the the uh was it my name is nobody and my name is still nobody or my name is trinity and all those oh yeah <laughs> um terrence was it terrence hill and uh oh, god I forget the other guy's name but um there's something about that music when they're doing their thing. It just, it does make me giggle yeah. it, to be able to evoke emotions in people with music. That is a talent. Yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. Uh, what are your aspirations right now? Just what I'm doing, which is, you know, keep putting out, you know, working with, uh, you know, my group, working with musicians that I respect and just putting out, albums and mm -hmm. uh doing that until they uh until they put me put me in a box somewhere <laughs> maybe they'll put me in a box before i die i don't know but um that's that's it just doing you know, the albums you know the releases that i'm doing now and and uh you know still have a couple other pieces you know still you know composing and writing and releasing music that's it you have any group that you like working with better than others well, I've got players that I love working with, you know, um, my drummer, Jim Bovey, him and I have played together for years and years and years, long time now. So, um, you know, Scott Looney, who, you know, piano player, mm -hmm. um, we played a lot together. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of musicians, you know, Dan Plonzi, Steve Adams from the Rova Saxophone Quartet. So, you know, these are players I love to love to play with, you know, too many to mention here, but, you know. I, I've been really fortunate to play with some awesome musicians who are willing to, you know, play my music, which is, you know, <laughs> probably the least interesting thing that they're doing that day. <laughs> but it's great when you have some people that you can count on, especially yep. when you're looking for a certain sound. And it's a, uh, I, I listened to uh, one of the pr uh, press release songs that, that uh, Billy James sent me. And uh, I, I went and watched the, the video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you Which had one the, was that? The, I can't remember the name of the song off the top of my head. I was like, I've got to remember when I talk to you. But uh, the, when you had the video game going and. Uh, oh, yeah. Side scroller. That's that's the yeah. one that 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 is just out now. That's the new album that's coming out in August. On the <laughs> fifth. It'll be available. Yeah. The one it well, starts out with percussion. And I thought and this whole yeah. the whole uh, thing is going to be nothing but percussion, and then bring in the horns and stuff. Yeah, you know, I was going. That's yeah, kind of uh, cool how it goes with the game. <laughs> yeah, well, the interesting thing about that is that you know, that's a that's that's a piece that I wrote for a group called uh, the Red Desert Ensemble, which mm -hmm. is Devin Maxwell, percussionist who I 
used to work with in New York. He actually lives in, in Utah now. Um, and his wife, uh, Katie Porter, who's an amazing bass clarinetist. So, you know, that's an example, actually, of a whole new series of pieces that I've been doing that, you know, for a lot of years, I've had game music over here, you know, working on different games and everything. And, you know, uh, my original music over here, concert or chamber music or albums that I was putting out. And I really wanted to try and bring those, bring those together. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I've been doing that through a, a various series of pieces. This is, this is one of those pieces where I realized that, you know, when I'm working on games, I'm spending so much time looking at uh, animations, right? Because games, you know, it's an animated world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not live action, usually, like film. And, you know, I'm looking at these very small, very exact animations that are playing over and over again and timing things to them. And I thought, well, that'd be cool to just do, let's, 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 let's time it to these small animations from all these cool side-scrolling games, you know, whether it's Mega Man or Castlevania or Angry Birds, right? Um, and so I started to look at them and just count out beat patterns and then started writing that stuff and then putting it together. And it turned into a really interesting piece. It's pushing, it's pushing me to do stuff that is new for me, right? Because, you know, one of my things is like, I could sit down and write a, you know, I could write a string quartet or a, you know, a band piece and, and you know, I've done that already. It's like I want to try and do some 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 new and some original things that I haven't done before. So this has been interesting to kind of bring these together and I think it's 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 uh super successful. They're an amazing ensemble. This is a really hard piece to play. Devin's an amazing percussionist. That uh, seriously, I'm not I'm not just like blowing smoke for, you know, just to make him look good or anything like that. What he had to do for that piece is um, so the the film, the video that you saw is made by this filmmaker. His name is Zig Grom. He lives over in uh, in Italy right now. And Zig and I have worked together. He's a, he's also a musician, but he's a he's you know been doing film and video for a long time. And you know we had to map out each and every one of those beat patterns and put a click track to it. And that's what Devin's listening to while he's playing. But it's not just like you know, you can get a good drummer who can play with a click track, you know, you've heard Steely Dan or whatever, you know, Zappa, you know, they're going to play with a click track, five, six minutes, no problem. Imagine 20 solid minutes, because this piece is an 18 minute piece, right? Jeez. Of exact repetition of patterns to these, you know, that are, it's repeating over and over and it's dead on to the click. Yeah, the speed up and slow down and all that. There's Man, that not was cool. many drummers cool. I know there's not many drummers or percussionists that I know who could who who would be able to do that like Devin did. I think mean, he's really phenomenal. It's very hard, very hard. And he totally nailed it. Sounds great. I can't help but chuckle thinking about it. And this might make you laugh too, but my, my two-year-old grandson, we've, we've been kind of taking turns watching him because uh, my wife works at home and my daughter works at home. And and so uh, it was. I was taking my break and I was in there with him and I decided to to play the, the video and he come and he just jumped up in my lap and he's sitting there and he's he's watching and he's looking at me and he's watching and then the uh the bass clarinet comes in it's like Wah! and he looks at me and goes Wah! and he just kept doing that every time that would play and he'd do that in my face <laughs> yeah see see this is what I discovered is that you know in my classes where I'm teaching because I'm teaching uh at San Francisco State now is one of the things that I'm doing, helping them to build their program in music for visual media. And I've been I've been actually teaching, you know, music for games for 12 years now in the classroom, you know. And I will have those students who like they can they're just vibrating. They cannot believe that they are in a class where they're like in college studying music for these games that they love. You know, they're just they're they're like they're like, I can't wait to tell my parents. <laughs> You know, it's like, I'm studying, see, I, it, it wasn't a waste of time. I'm studying game music in, in college, you know. Um, but it's a great, it, it has a great effect when you see these games in context, out of context, they connect with people, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen um, any of these touring shows like Game On or Video Games Live. Um, hey, to be honest with you, I'm really not into video games, Um never have been music, you should check out some of the music man you know who you would like you would really like 
is if you go back and listen, if you listen to some of the Final Fantasy music, uh, there's a composer, he's sort of like the Beethoven, I don't want, it's not right to say Beethoven because it's not the right stylistic reference, um, but Nibuho is kind of like the, he's he's like the quintessential classicist of, of, of video game music. And he, you know, it, he's, it's really prog related, you know, lots of odd time signatures, lots of, you know, very, you know, lots of propulsion to the music. And I think you'd really, you'd really like it a lot. And in fact, there's a band called the Black Mages that only play his music, kind of like heavy metal, speed metal band that only play the music of, of Nibuho and Final Fantasy. So, you yeah, know, I'd it, love got, prog rock yeah it's got an amazing connection that's the thing about games is you can't you can't pigeonhole it you can't say you know back in the day when you know composers like koji kondo right who wrote the original mario games and you know when you know they were they were making music with hammers and chisels man they were you know you couldn't just be a a musician you had to be a programmer too you know mm. because you were working you know in systems that really weren't very robust for music you know but over the years i mean not only has there been just an, an amazing diversity of music for video games right from full orchestral scores you know that sound like film scores right all the way through to chip tunes and you know those are the sounds like when i started in in, in games doing games in the 90s you know those were the sounds we were trying to get away from we wanted to do as much live stuff as we could but now kids you know especially students in my class younger people they love chip tunes they love the sound of the old game boys they love the sound of the old video game systems you know um and there's a reason for it too man that stuff actually sounds really freaking cool i mean i did play pac-man back in the day and yeah uh centipede and and there was one that i i loved above all of them it was called a uh, scramble yep I don't know if you remember that where you're going through a cavern in a spaceship yep. and shooting up there. Well, anyway, um, yep. but man, my my kids and my my grandkids, good lord, they love those games. That's it, right. You know what we wanted things like footballs and bicycles and stuff for Christmas. Now they want uh, Nintendos and Xboxes and that's right. This game and that could shoot man. Those games alone were about what we paid for a whole video console back in the day <laughs> that's right and th so that's why it's like it's it's awesome for me to see you know when I start to bring it over kind of cross it over you know people really respond you know to the imagery i mean video games are are, are art you know oh, they yeah. always have been high art um uh, pop art you know if mm. you want however you want to describe it but you know it's a uh, cool stuff well shoot my like my grandson uh, the young my middle grandson i'm sorry he he's into minecraft or at least he mm -hmm. was and the other one was into something called the five nights at freddy's or something like that five nights at freddy's yeah Good it's gonna scare the wits out of him <laughs> <laughs> you know what do you want for christmas and it was everything related to those games yep and you go to the store and there's just tons of products whether it's yep. the toys or t-shirts or you know posters whatever all of this stuff man it, it's it's kind of reminiscent of how things were when we watched superheroes on tv and you had all the batman toys and batman merchandise the same for superman spider-man all those and i had the is, batmobile i had the batmobile actually shoot little, shoot little missiles out of it <laughs> I actually have the uh, 1966 Batmobile oh. displayed in my living room. This oh, that, what. I've got a uh, Rock'em Sock'em Robots in the other room. Oh, uh, do you? Yeah, it's not the original though. You know, the originals are really big. You know, but I got it. I yeah, I got it. <laughs> I, uh, I I had an actress on my show, and she was in an episode of the Six Million Dollar Man. And so that was my hero back in the day. I wanted to be Steve Austin. Oh, and yeah. I, I found this little space shuttle that you open up, and it's a, 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 a 
it's a medical table, whatever to, to help fix his electronics and all that. Got the little wires and tubes you stick up to. And I showed that to her. She got such a chuckle out of it. I'm like, yeah, I still collect that stuff. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You probably have an electronic football set. Man, I I did for the longest time. And we moved, and I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> I I think my first wife just started throwing stuff away when I wasn't looking. <laughs> By far, one of the most frustrating things ever made for kids, man. Remember that thing? You'd, you'd set it up. You'd spend like 10 hours setting up your teams, and then you'd hit the thing. <laughs> it just go off in all, <laughs> all directions. You're going. Made no sense at all. And it's funny because the, the label on it's got the NFL yep. and, you know, you could be the Cowboys and the Redskins or whatever. And you open it up and they're, you know, you got what blue <laughs> ones and white ones or whatever. And, yep. and there's no logos on the helmets. It's just these little plastic things and you turn on the board and it just is like, where's the fun in that? Yeah. yeah. It was, it was, it was pretty, uh, I still got it. I still wanted it, but it was pretty disappointing. Not not as disappointing as sea monkeys, though. Oh my god! Real, yeah. The the little uh, what do you call them? The the brine shrimp, shrimp. brine oh, shrimp. Man. I was that kid, man. I saw the sea monkeys in the comics, and you know it was like the picture of the dads going off to work in the car, and moms like at home, and I'm like. <laughs> this is awesome. I'm going to get this. I'm going to have like little friends, you know, maybe they'll talk to me. I don't know. I was like that kid. And I, I was like super excited. I ordered sea monkeys and they showed up. I was crushed. Wah, I was crushed. Brian <laughs> shrimp, dude. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. Oh, it's terrible. Gosh. Yeah. How many times did you open up a comic book and go through all the advertisements and say, I want this, I want this, I want this, the x-ray goggles and <laughs> you know, the squirting flower and the buzzer, hand buzzer. And yep. Jeez, man. It's the only reason I ever ate fruit pies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. The things we had as kids. Man. I know. I, I, I so miss those days. I do. I reminisce so much. I, I'm going to go senile and I'll be that, <laughs> that guy in the corner of the old folks home, just talking about uh, GI Joe and <laughs> crap we played with as kids. Yeah. But I do like the fact that some of these streaming services on TV are starting to bring back those old cartoons that we watched as kids. Cause I've sat down and watched super friends with my yep. grandson. He loves it some great music for those shows too oh yeah yeah wouldn't that be the ultimate get an old cartoon to, to i mean a character and and be able to do the cartoon theme for it yeah there's some great themes man written for those like the old spider-man and you know white curtain who wrote all the the you know um uh flintstones and mm -hmm. you know those themes the jetsons i mean that's all the stuff that Danny Elfman came along later and other composers, you know, in reference to Carl Stallings, who did all the, who did all the uh, Warner Brothers cartoons. Mm -hmm. oh, I love the old music from the, the Looney Tunes, man. Oh, yeah. But I think my favorite theme song was the uh, Banana Splits. Oh, love the Banana Splits. <laughs> One banana, two banana, three banana, four. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're if you if you're into it, you can go onto YouTube and just put in you know '70s TV cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm. They have them just strung out, and and you can just see them all go by. Amazing music, man. A lot of times, that's how I get my grandson to calm down in the car when we're on a trip. So I just put on those old theme songs, and yeah. Except when we get to Batman, he makes me play Batman probably 30 <laughs> times in a row. <laughs> I like him already. <laughs> pop off Batman. Pop off Batman. I like him pop already, man. That's, that's good taste right there. <laughs> oh, man. So um, you've got that album coming out. And uh, what are, are you working on another project right now? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, working on, um, let's see. So the string quartet remaster is going to come out on the first. 
after that, um, I've got two pieces that are in production that I'm mm -hmm. starting to work on. One is, uh, it, it, these are pieces again, that are kind of tied to this whole concept that I was telling you about. So, um, they're, they're abstract and a little bit weird. Like that piece is a little weird. Like I, it, I don't know if you made it all the way through all eight oh, yeah. minutes, but if you did, I, I hope your, your brain's okay. <laughs> I, hope there's not, there's, I hope there's no permanent damage from that because, uh, you know, I, it's interesting, you know, just talking about side scroller, by the way. So, you know, this music in, influenced by all these side scrolling games, you know, since you've watched it with the video now, if you're really, you know, adventurous, try sitting down and just listening to the, the recording right because it's a different experience mm. um it has a different completely like the the this is what i kind of like about this is that the the music tied to the images has a completely different effect than just listening to the music on its own um which is which is which is pretty interesting so the the next two pieces that i have coming up one is uh a, a, a double quartet so for eight strings two string quartets oh wow um which is actually it's called match three and it's actually made to go and be heard inside of a match three game, you know, like Fruit Ninja or one of those games. Um, so when it comes out, you'll be able to play it and listen to it. And you'll also be able to just listen to it if you want to just on, on an album. You know, that's kind of my thing. It's like, you know, you know, one piece, multiple screens, multiple places to listen to it in, in, in different ways. Um, you know what is it uh you know multiple screens one vision or something like that i should come up with a with a tagline for it um but that's that's the next piece that's going to be rolling out after that and then um and then we'll see after that there's a piece for trumpet and string quartet also so this is a lot of stuff that was i wrote during the pandemic that you know it was hard to get recorded so I'm just starting to get into the studio and record those yeah do you, do you have a website Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. Just Steve Horowitz music. You can go there and everything's up there. The albums, the scores, the you know. Yeah, it's all there. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna put the link up in the description. Yep. So just people Steve can Horowitz click on it. Com. Yeah. And you have what, 30 albums to your name? I just hit number 30, just hit, yeah. Wow. That's incredible, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I remember actually thinking like my own, my whole goal when I was, when I was in my twenties was like, I just want to put out one album. Like I, I want to hold it in my hand that has my name on it. And so to have gotten to 30 at this point, it's like, it's, it's pretty good. You know, it's pretty, pretty good. Like we said, I'm never going to catch Zappa. <laughs> I'm never going to catch up to him with the, that number of albums, but I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep trying. <laughs> You'll get there. You'll get there. I got confidence <laughs> in you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, anyway, Steve, thank you so much for your time, man. I've enjoyed this conversation and, and yeah. I'd like to stay in touch with you if you could. Oh, absolutely, man. Great. It's thank great to talk to you too. And uh, yeah, thanks for having, uh, having me on your show. And uh, I would like to also thank all of you out there. If you are new to the channel, I appreciate you stopping by. I hope you'll hit that subscribe button and please come back. For those of you who are regular, thank you so much for your support. It's it's because of y'all that I, I get to bring, bring people like Steve on here and, and uh, we get to enjoy their time. And so until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.